mutation and evolution of emerging diseases, specifically RNA viruses. Uh, and our speaker this evening is Dr. Eddie Holmes, who is a researcher at the Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics at Pennsylvania State University. He's also a professor of biology there and has been there since 2005. He's taught at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, including being a lecturer in evolutionary biology. And his research focuses are on the evolution of RNA viruses, with special emphasis on the evolution and epidemiology of major human pathogens, including influenza and the dengue virus, the key mechanisms of viral evolution, and the factors that allow viruses to jump species and emerge in new host species. Exactly what we saw with H1N1, bird flu, and a lot of other things. This is very topical, uh, very relevant to today's society. Uh, and he's authored over 250 scientific papers and published two books, so he also knows what he's talking about, and other people know that he knows what he's talking about. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Dr. Eddie Holmes. Annie, very, thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I hope my accent's understandable. I'm, actually, I'm not from Pennsylvania, from England, so I, I kind of country twanged my voice. Um, if you wind the clock back, maybe, what is it, seven years now, you, I'm sure you remember the epidemic of SARS that hit uh, globally in 2002, 2003. And SAR, the SARS epidemic really, in a nutshell, describes what I want to discuss tonight. So, um, the story, if you remember rightly, if you remember correctly, it started, uh, the epidemic started in southern China at the end of 2002, got to Hong Kong, then it got into kind of global um, aircraft travel network, spread to Canada, USA, Europe. During that time period, very quick actually, uh, just a few months, about 8,500 people were infected and about 800 died. So in the great scheme of things, that's a very small number of people actually. We, we dodged a bullet actually, we, we did very well at controlling this. but. Um, it kind of emphasizes that our species is exposed to new things, new diseases like SARS, on a fairly regular basis. So SARS was 2002-2003. Um, in the last sort of 20, 30 years, many people have been trying to, to look at these new diseases that hit human populations and trying to kind of categorize what they are and where they come from. Here's a list I took that was made in 1990s, 20 years ago now. It's just a list then they thought of diseases that were emerging, or viruses that were emerging, new things that are spreading in our species. Okay, some, the list is that you can read them yourself, some you're very familiar with, HIV, for example, influenza, yellow fever, some you, I'm sure you've never heard of, um, Oropush, Rifali fever, some you can't even pronounce, Nyong Nyong, I'm not sure what that is. Um, luckily for us, you can see that where they're from, they're not, they don't tend to be found in Washington, D.C. They tend to be more tropical. The key thing, though, is, is the, 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 tape, the column on the, on the, on the far um, right there, that they all have, nearly all have, um, reservoirs in other animal species. These, these are viruses that infect other animal, animals and then jump some way into humans, okay? So HIV comes from chimpanzees and monkeys. Um, Flu comes from birds, ultimately. So these, these viruses come from other species and jump into humans, okay? Key point. Now, that list was made in 1990. Since 1990, a number of other new viruses have been discovered in our, in our species. Um, hepatitis C, massive global problem. Sinombre, Nipah, Hendra, West Nile, SARS, of course. And most recently, um, H1N1 influenza virus. So we're continually being bombarded with these new infections, new viruses in our species. There's one more key thing about this, this list I want you to see, and that's that all of these viruses, except monkeypox, the bottom one there, they are all RNA viruses. So their genome, their nucleic acid, is made of RNA, not DNA. Because you know, we as, as, as mammals, and most of life, has a DNA genome, a DNA um, nucleic acid as their, it makes up their cells. RNA viruses are unique in their genome is made of RNA, and that's very important, you'll see this shortly. So, and so I now, now want to just develop very briefly two more themes. One, that viruses jump from other species into humans, and two, the most emerging, most new things are RNA viruses. So on the first point, the idea that, that, that we're exposed to, to viruses from, that jump from other species, go back to SARS, so we now know where SARS came, came from. So there's SARS viruses, coronavirus, they're quite common RNA viruses. SARS jumped, and, um, the, the immediate host was a thing called a palm civet. It's a, it's a, it's a, a carnivore, lives in southern China. It's, it, this is a picture from a, a market. It's being sold in the market. People eat, uh, eat this thing in that part of the world. So that's where it came from initially. But ultimately, the reservoir of this virus are, are bats, particularly horseshoe bats. 
So bats carry naturally lots and lots of viruses. And then somehow that virus jumped from bats into civets and civets into humans. And that story's been replayed numerous times. Animals carry these viruses. We interrupt the natural world. We get exposed. The virus jumps into our species. The second point was that most things are RNA viruses. So very briefly, it's a kind of very quick schematic what viruses look like. For those of you who don't really understand, haven't seen them before, um, no detail whatsoever. Suffice to say, they're very, very small. And I have a little cartoon here of the kind of different shapes they come in, the kind of different shapes and sizes. They have um, two, uh, a number of key features. One, they're absolutely parasitic, so they cannot survive without a host cell. So one of the final features of viruses is they must enter a cell to replicate. They parasitize that host machinery very, very intimately. And that host can be a human, it can be an animal, a plant, a bacterium, a fungus, whatever. Um, second, they all contain a kind of, um, a, a, the genome, the RNA or DNA, and then a kind of protein shell around it. It's a kind of, a kind of um, defining feature. And the one more thing to understand that's absolutely critical for my the problem with RNA viruses is that RNA viruses evolve remarkably quickly. RNA, as a molecule, is very error-prone. It's very unstable. It doesn't copy itself very well. It makes lots of errors. So it turns out, it's the kind of thing I do for a living, that RNA viruses evolve about one million times faster than human genes do. And that's the problem. They are it's like having an old cassette recorder, if you remember those, and pushing the fast forward button. Evolution's on fast forward in RNA viruses. They're absolutely churning along. And that gives them the ability to make the mutations that allow them to adapt to new hosts like humans. So they are evolution just on fast forward. They're incredible, incredibly rapid evolutionary machines. Okay, well, one million times faster than human genes. So for the very brief for the future, What's going to happen to our species? I think it's, it's, it's a very simple statement, which I can make with no fear of contradiction, that we will get more new infections in the future. It's absolutely going to happen. Okay? And the way we live today makes that happen. Um, so again, animal species contain lots and lots of pathogens, lots, lots of viruses and other, and other things too. We interact with those species way, now in ways that we never did before. There's widespread deforestation, okay? And that deforestation, that process, allows us to get into contact with animal species very intimately and their viruses can jump with them. Other, other changing uh, uh, land use for agriculture, again, exposes us to, um, to pathogens. Mega cities, this is Shanghai, it's typical, it's not, not a particular thing about Shanghai, any big city, they are real reservoirs for, for diseases. That many people living in that, that confined space allows these things, to, viruses, to spread very rapidly and establish themselves. Um, international travel, I've got, I can show you slides, I haven't got them here, but I can show you how viruses track airline routes, okay? So as people move around, they bring their bugs with them. So all the security screening you want to do, you're not going to stop someone carrying just naturally a, a pathogen with them. Um, wars, political unrest, the, all those things associated with, 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 with viral diseases. So how do we solve that? Well, the, to me, the, the, the obvious thing is we need really good global surveillance and global cooperation. Now, SARS worked very well. As soon as SARS came along in Southeast Asia, the kind of global health community acted very quickly and stopped airline routes, um, kind of global cooperation. And we, I, I think we did a really good job, but we need more of that.